Okay, yes, there we go. Cool, I guess we will uh, get started. I'm assuming people can hear me. I'll, I'll speak up, usually not a problem. Um, cool, thanks uh, everybody for uh, joining. Let me get this bigger. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, Drupal State and the need for a uh, JavaScript SDK. I hope you're in the right place. If you're not, I won't be insulted. Um, but yeah, uh, excited to be here in, uh, in Prague. Um, it's been wonderful so far, and it's really great being uh, back in person. Um, so uh, yeah, I am Brian Perry. I am a uh, staff engineer at Pantheon. I am uh, an initiative coordinator for Drupal's Decoupled Menus Initiative, which we are so close to uh, wrapping up here at uh, DrupalCon, which is great. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I live uh, in the Chicago suburbs in the United States. I uh, enjoy Drupal, JavaScript, and uh, all things Nintendo. I uh, started playing uh, Splatoon 3, which is a lot of fun. And then uh, I, I did buy, I will admit that I bought an Xbox recently, and I've been playing Outer Wilds on that, which is a really fun, it's like a time loop game. Um, almost done with that, too. And uh, also, yeah, semi-recently bought a, uh, a replica Ms. Pac-Man machine, which I have in my office for you know very professional work times. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm on uh, the internet in a variety of places and uh, would love to connect and internet with you. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, I work at uh, Pantheon. Um, so the things I would love to thank Pantheon for is uh, one, you know, sponsoring for me to come out here. Um, also, uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about today are things that uh, Pantheon has uh, sponsored open source work for, which is wonderful. Um, and also, yeah, check out our booth. We have uh, our front end sites, uh, our node hosting in early access. Um, a lot of what I focus on at Pantheon is working on starter kits and utilities. Um, so a lot of great uh, open source work happening there, and yeah, would love to know uh, what you think. But uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, a, a, a library called Drupal State, which is a simple data store for managing application state sourced from Drupal. We'll talk about uh, why it was originally created, why you might want to use it, and why I think uh, it or something like it is very important for the future of Drupal. Uh, but also, really, um, you know, while we'll be using that as a framework, we're also going to go on a winding journey through Drupal's supporting JavaScript ecosystem as well. So buckle up. <laughs> um, so uh, I talked about the, uh, I mentioned the Decoupled Menus initiative um, and uh, at uh, DrupalCon US uh, a while back at this point, um, we put together a hackathon uh, where a number of people got together to try to build JavaScript components that consume data from the new menus endpoint that's being developed in Drupal. So this is uh, a web component. I, I focused on building a web component because I wanted to learn more about web components. We also had people who create things in React and Vue. Um, but yeah, you can see uh, this uh, menu component. It has menu data from Drupal. We can expand and collapse things in the tree. It's intentionally kind of uh, stripped down so that the styles can be overridden. Um, if we look at the actual HTML file here, it's, it's pretty simple. We have a custom element, gdwc-menu. Uh, that stands for generic Drupal web components. I'm not, maybe not the best at naming things. Um, but uh, you know, you'll see here that uh, there's some attributes we can pass in. Uh, there's the branding, so we can you know, change the heading in the, the menu. The base URL is the root of the Drupal instance that we're sourcing data from. Uh, the menu ID he here, if we change what the menu ID is, we change it to the account menu. Now if we expand it, source new data from Drupal, we see the login link because we're not authenticated. Um, I'll change that back to main. And then there also is a, uh, a theme uh, property here. So we have uh, horizontal. Um, we can instead do unstyled, um, which literally just shows that there's no styling at all. It's just an unordered list. Um, and also if we leave it off, uh, the default styling just has, you know, Lightly styled, expand and collapse. Um, so 
this ended up being, you know, a, a pretty interesting uh, proof of concept in how uh, something like a web component could make it simpler to create a component that plays nicely and generically with Drupal. Um, getting into the details of it a little bit, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, web components, uh, as in like the, the browser APIs, um, they have a number of lifecycle methods. Uh, this is the connected callback method, which essentially uh, happens when the component mounts. So this is how we're getting the data from Drupal. So uh, if the base URL and menu ID are defined, we run this uh, fetch data method. And uh, here's the detail for that. N you know, not super complicated. Um, we're taking the base URL and menu ID and using that to construct the endpoint that we're going to talk to. And then we just use JavaScript fetch, some light error handling, and then we take the response and using uh, a supporting uh, package uh, that was also created as part of the initiative, we parse the menu data so it can be you know, a little bit easier to work with, represented in a hierarchy, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think this is, was kind of an interesting approach to you know, show you know, how a component like this could be built that really took the work of communicating with JSON API and allowed you to just kind of plug, plug and play. Um, so after that, we started thinking about, you know, how could we build other components in this library? Um, but uh, pretty quickly, it was apparent that that approach uh, wouldn't really scale. So I if you imagine like a card, you know, which is a card component, something uh, pretty common that might be a, a next thing to build. Um, if you have one card on the, the page, that's one API call, you know, if we're using that approach where it's embedded inside uh, of the component. Uh, you already have your menu, which might be another API call. If you got 10 cards on the, the screen, that's 10 API calls. If you got 100 cards or some sort of uh, automatic scroll, you, you might be running into some problems. Um, so at that point, um, you know, it seemed like there were some things that this, uh, this component library would need to be able to uh, you know, scale past just you know, the, the menu component, but also cases where you have you know, an application or a, a page where there's data that needs to be shared across a variety of components in a consistent way. So uh, what, what did I think we needed? Uh, easy methods to source data from Drupal's JSON API so that um, they can be used uh, across the, the various components. And then some sort of solution to be able to manage the application state that we get back from Drupal that a variety of components can take advantage of. Um, and that seemed like not a crazy ask and something that, you know, as a, as a JavaScript developer, I could just go npm install something that solves my problem. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time, it, it really didn't appear to be quite that easy. So I, I looked at other projects in the community and, um, for example, uh, uh, Druxt, uh, which is a Vue-based uh, project, they have their own custom JSON API client, which uses Axios, and it uses the Vuex store, which makes sense because it's a Vue project. And then uh, next for Drupal, th this was uh, a, a while back, so it was prior to the 1.3 release. Um, and at that point, next for Drupal had a bunch of individual helper functions. Um, and then uh, more recently, they have also introduced their own client. Um, which definitely has uh, some similarities to the, this project that we'll be talking uh, about today. There's a, l a lot of overlap in, in what the two clients do. Um, there were other SDK libraries like Drupal SDK, Drupal JS SDK, who knows which one's which, if any of them are official Drupal things. Um, and then on uh, just custom builds, custom decoupled builds, you know, I've been familiar with people just rolling their own in general. I, I don't know if that, that's been your experience, but you know, people write their own fetch things. They, they you know, write their own methods to handle state. Um, a lot of solving this problem over and over and over. So, yeah, what, what would we need to stop solving this problem repeatedly? So, uh, something framework agnostic. You know, if we're trying to think of something that could apply broadly to people are, who are using Drupal in a decoupled architecture. Um, also, the ability to use just the utilities your project needs. I, I, I do think that there can be some useful defaults here, wh which we'll talk about. 
Um, but there are going to be situations where maybe somebody just wants to use the fetch utilities, or they want to use their JavaScript frameworks uh, state management uh, utilities. Maybe they want to use Redux or something. Um, so if the individual pieces are exposed, people can just use what they want and use it with their state management, for example. Uh, but also at the same time, I do think having some sort of out-of-the-box solution for handling application state could be really useful. So you know, people don't necessarily have to think about that or customize that unless they want to. And then also, uh, you know, as I started thinking about this, I, I also started thinking about um, JSON API in general. Um, and like, could uh, interacting with JSON API be friendlier for JavaScript developers? Like, what is the experience of a JavaScript developer who may not be familiar with Drupal, uh, who finds their way into getting data from JSON API? So yeah, specifically thinking about this from the perspective of people who maybe either aren't familiar with Drupal or aren't specifically familiar with the JSON API spec or Drupal's implementation of it. So yeah, the, the kind of best way, I, I think, to, to explore that a little bit is just through some quick examples. Um, so the, uh, for uh, JSON API, uh, I assume many of you have probably interacted with JSON API, but I'm not going to assume that, that everybody has. Um, so you may know what the endpoint, uh, so this example is getting recipe data from the you know, Umami demo profile. Uh, as a developer, you may know what the recipe's endpoint is, um, but you might not if you're not familiar with uh, JSON API or Drupal's implementation of it or intimately familiar with the site that you're going to be getting the data from. Um, you may not know that endpoint. So the root of JSON API gives you an index of all the available endpoints. So uh, you may have to first fetch that to be able to determine what the recipe's endpoint is, which we're, we're doing that here. And then at that point, you can fetch uh, that from that endpoint. And then we get all the recipes which are under the, uh, the data object. And um, so if we wanted to, uh, for example, access the instructions for a single recipe, the response that you get back from JSON API, um, it also definitely does have uh, some uh, Drupal-specific things inside of it. So um, many of the fields are under attributes rather than just kind of at the top level. So if we wanted to get the instructions, it would, for the first data uh, 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 entry in the array, it would be attributes dot field underscore recipe underscore instruction dot value. And then uh, think of a situation where uh, later you needed to get, so that the, the root recipes endpoint will get you all of the recipes. Um, if you, in the future you needed a specific recipe, um, you could uh, fetch with a uh, UUID here to get just that recipe, but that's really a redundant API call at this point because we already got our recipes. So if you somehow store the first response, so in this case, you know, we're just storing it as a variable, um, you can get that existing data. Uh, in this case, you would have to filter through uh, the recipes that you have by ID and find the recipe that matches based on the ID to be able to get that particular recipe. Again, not you know three lines of JavaScript, but there's still three lines of JavaScript that need to be written. And then going into some other examples, um, this is uh, if you want to deal with a, uh, a referenced entity in Drupal. So something simple here, uh, just a taxonomy term. Um, I really do not want to install Firefox. <laughs> uh, so, um, the, we want basically just want to print out the recipe category for this recipe on the screen, which is main courses. Um, so uh, we know the endpoint that will give us this particular resource, uh, JSON API and Drupal's implementation of it. Uh, there are a number of query string parameters you can pass in to do things like uh, include related data, filter, sort, etc. Um, but you know people have to be familiar with this structure. But we can uh, say include field recipe category to get the recipe category. Uh, we fetch that, 
we'll get our uh, response back. Um, but how the response comes back, uh, again, for somebody who's not familiar with the JSON API spec, this might take a little parsing to figure out. Um, but under relationships, let's see, we have our recipe category. So under relationships, uh, we just have the ID of the, the recipe category. Um, but then by saying to include the recipe category, under included, we have all of the included recipe categories uh, for this. So if we wanted to, to uh, get this particular recipe category, we would have to filter all of the included values uh, because, you know, in this case, there's just one recipe category, but it could be multiple. And that uh, set of included data is shared across the whole response. So if we were getting all of the recipes, that would be all of the categories um, for all of the recipes. So we have to look it up based on ID. So uh, again, we have to filter uh, based on the ID to get the correct category. And then to actually uh, get the name, it's uh, attributes.name. Name is under attributes uh, in the category. So uh, all that to say, all the data is there, but it's a pretty long walk uh, to print main courses on the screen. Um, and then also, an, you know, another common issue is uh, overfetching uh, with JSON API. So by default, uh, JSON API gives you all the stuff, uh, which is definitely useful. Um, but oftentimes, like think of a teaser, um, uh, you know, or you know, a grid uh, of items. You might only need a, a few fields. You might only need like three fields rather than everything. So uh, being specific about what you get back in the response will have a, a pretty substantial impact on your payload. So if we want to do that with JSON API, we can. There's uh, again things uh, that we can add to the the query string. So if we include field recipe category, we're going to get all of the fields on the recipe and all of the fields on the category, which we don't need. So again, thinking about like a teaser, you know, maybe we need four fields on the recipe. Um, so you can add uh, fields and then the, the entity type here, node recipe, and then list out the fields that you want. So if we do that for node recipe, we can say title, difficulty, instruction, and category. That still gives us more stuff than we want because uh, we'll get just those fields, but the recipe category, the referenced entity, will have all of the fields. So we have to refine that further and say fields, taxonomy term, recipe category, we just want the name. So uh, again, all, all of the tools are here, um, but you know, it takes a little work to structure a request that is going to give us just the stuff that we want. Uh, there is a great uh, package, Drupal JSON API params, that simplifies this quite a bit. Um, adds some utilities to construct these uh, JSON API uh, requests. Um, highly recommended, uh, but you know, again, it's something that you have to know exists. So uh, this is just seeing that example uh, on its feet a little bit. So we have our uh, URL that we constructed. We can fetch it, um, but still, even you know, we've gone through all that work to be really specific about what we're getting back. We still have the structure of the JSON API response, some things that are under attributes, our relationships, and the included data that we have to navigate. So um, it's still maybe not as clean as, as we would expect. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? Doing good? Excellent. Head nodding. Great. Uh, cool. I know where you know, lunch is next, so everybody's level. Uh, cool. So the. Uh, Talking about overfetching uh, definitely leads to uh, GraphQL um, and uh, GraphQL within the, the Drupal community. So GraphQL, it's a, a, a different uh, query language and it's really good at solving this problem of, of overfetching um, because in your request, you essentially describe the shape of the response that you want. You specify all the fields, exactly how they would be structured and the API responds matching that shape uh, that you specified. So uh, I am not heavily involved in Drupal's uh, GraphQL ecosystem, so this is a my somewhat uninformed overview, but I, I would say uh, GraphQL and Drupal's relationship is, uh, I it's complicated. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing is that uh, the GraphQL module is a contrib module, it's not in Drupal core, 
uh, JSON API is in Drupal core. And again, I'm trying to you know think of this problem from the perspective of people who might be new to some of these things. Um, and then the GraphQL uh, module itself uh, went through a pretty substantial change from version three to version four. Version three works pretty similar to JSON API where you enable it, uh, there's not a lot of config, and it essentially exposes uh, a schema for all of your Drupal data. So you can just start querying things. Uh, version four, on the other hand, does, does not do that. It doesn't automatically generate a schema. You have to write custom code to define your schema. So pretty big architectural difference. Uh, my understanding is that the, you know, the reasoning behind that, which you know, is valid, uh, is the, the version three approach would uh, essentially leak a lot of Drupalisms into the API. Um, so it probably isn't representing the ideal API structure for people. And the version four approach really allows people to tailor the API to their specific needs. But that comes with a really big cost in that you, you have to write custom code to do it. And I definitely see that as, as a barrier. Um, Experimented with some things ar around this uh, in uh, the Drupal state library. This is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but it fits here. Um, we uh, did add functionality to use uh, like lightweight GraphQL, GraphQL queries against JSON API. There actually were some existing libraries that handled that. Um, and it was, you know, nice, really nice developer experience, but we found it was a little difficult to maintain that path along with traditional JSON API communication. And then also uh, some of the libraries that we were depending on really weren't maintained anymore. So uh, we've, we've deprecated that feature recently. Um, but also uh, within the, the community, uh, Jesus at uh, Octahedroid, uh, a friend of, uh, of Pantheon, uh, the Octahedroid team has been working on the uh, GraphQL Compose module, which actually is a supporting module that will allow you to automatically generate a schema for GraphQL. So that kind of allows us to have the best of both worlds. You wanna uh, build your own perfect custom schema, you can do that. Uh, you want to just generate the best representation of your Drupal data, you can do that as well. Um, and for the future of you know, this library, you know, uh, with, with that problem being solved, like I could see us adding some sort of like actual official GraphQL support in the future. So uh, back to, uh, to Drupal State and, and how it solves some of these problems that we talked about, or at least uh, tries to. <laughs> it is, uh, it's framework agnostic, it's vanilla JavaScript, so you can use it with whatever JavaScript framework you want or no framework at all. Uh, it's universal, so it, it can run on the server and the client. Um, it, uh, the first request uh, that you make to get uh, an object from Drupal, it will make an API call. Um, if it doesn't have that data already, and then it will serve future requests from local state. So it caches the response. So if you wanted to get an individual recipe, for example, um, it won't make an API f call for it. Uh, by default, also, the response is uh, deserialized and flattened and a little bit simpler. Um, and the, all of the underlying functions and, and utilities are exported and made available from the library. So if you wanted to just use the pieces here, you could. So uh, we'll look at some quick examples just to kind of get a feel for the difference if, if we were to use uh, this uh, library. So we import uh, Drupal state and then create an instance of the store. Um, and we provide the, the API base. Um, there's, you can also provide an optional API prefix if your root is not JSON API and you've customized it. Um, and then, uh, Getting all of the recipes in this case uh, is as simple as, as this one line. So await store and then we call get object and pass in the object name, node recipe in this case. And then uh, this is what the data that we get back looks like. You can see here it's uh, deserialized and uh, a lot uh, substantially more flattened, including things that are reference entities. They're still uh, up at the top level, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. And then if we uh, next needed to get, an, or later needed to get an individual recipe and knew the ID, um, we can use get object again and provide the ID. And in that case, it's going to see that it already has data for that recipe. 
and return that from the local store rather than making a request to JSON API. So it can cut down on uh, API requests pretty substantially if you use that cache in. And then this is looking at the, uh, the reference entity taxonomy term example that we looked at. Um, uh, the Drupal JSON API params package is also a dependency of Drupal state. So we're gonna use that here. We create our store, we create an instance of Drupal JSON API params, and then uh, use its add include uh, helper to add the recipe category. And then when we make our get object request for this particular recipe, we uh, just pass in that params object. You can use Drupal JSON API params if you'd rather just construct the query string yourself. You can do that too and just pass that in. Either approach works. And then with our uh, response back, if we wanted to get the recipe category, uh, it is, uh, recipe category is a, an array, it can have multiple results, um, but it's just the, you know, in this case there's just one, so field recipe category uh, dot name. Let's see if we can find that in here, yeah. Here is the field recipe category, um, yeah, kind of at the top level, and you just have the flattened data under the recipe category. So a little bit easier to, to get at the data using these deserialized responses. And then um, uh, we've also uh, been working to support uh, some popular uh, modules in the JSON API ecosystem. So uh, this is an example of uh, support for the uh, the uh, decoupled router module, which lets you look up a, uh, an entity in Drupal uh, by resolving uh, the path alias. So uh, in this case, you can use get object by path, uh, provide the object name and the path, and the response that you get back is the recipe that resolves to that path. So handles a, a handful of things behind the scenes to do that, but gives a, a pretty simple API uh, to make that call. And then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we also expose all of these utilities. So if, for example, you wanted, uh, you know, this translate path utility that we use to talk to decoupled router, you could instead just import translate path and use that to your, your heart's content. Um, so that, that method takes the, uh, the, uh, uh, the a API endpoint for decoupled router, and then uh, the path uh, that you want to resolve. So, and here the response that we get back is just exactly what the decoupled router endpoint returns. And this is uh, an example. Uh, this is the code, the TypeScript code for that um, method. It's not super complicated, uh, but you know, it's not something that necessarily needs to be written over and over, you know, if we need to, to communicate with the decoupled router endpoint. So um, that, you know, again, a, uh, a, a quite a long tangent. Uh, we started by looking at that menu component in the uh, generic Drupal web components project, and then realized that there was a problem that we needed to solve to be able to make it more realistic to be able to have a bunch of components that share uh, Drupal's uh, application state. Um, so that actually allows us to now go back to uh, the generic Drupal web components. And now that we have some of these problems solved in a generic and kind of reusable way, uh, we can focus on the things that, that make uh, this design system, for example, uh, more unique. And you know, hopefully uh, it also allows you within your projects to do similar things. So. Uh, here, this is uh, using the card component in, in the, the library. Um, again, working with the same set of, of recipe data. So if we go into the markup here, uh, we created a couple of uh, additional web components that use uh, Drupal state and the utilities that we've been talking about. So there is the store web component and the provider uh, web component. So the store really is just an interface to the Drupal state store that we saw some examples of. Uh, pass in similar parameters there, including our API base. And then any of the provider components within it uh, basically allow you to interface with that store, um, 
and make requests. So we, uh, this is really similar to like the get object calls that we saw. So here we're saying that we want to get a recipe with a particular ID, uh, pass in some query string parameters for, for JSON API. And then now uh, th you can use a, a HTML template inside of that provider and it just has access to the scope of the provider that it's in. So it has the data that it gets back uh, from the store. Um, and that template is an HTML template. So it can be any markup. So as you'll see here towards the bottom, we just have you know, regular uh, headings and a paragraph. Um, but we can also use a card component from the library. It could also be any web component, any custom element. So uh, for example, there's the outline project. Um, there's another Drupal-friendly design system. Uh, you could use outline components here within your template and just pass in Drupal's data or, you know, whatever you would like. So, a couple other examples of wh what's possible with this. So, um, you know, we have uh, kind of a, a twig style double curly brace to reference uh, the variables here. So, right now we just have a placeholder, but I can just do title. Uh, to get the title from this particular recipe, Deep Mediterranean Quiche. Um, and, uh, you know, in this case, we, uh, we probably don't need uh, this anymore. Um, but yeah, so we have one result. If there's one result, it renders out that template. Uh, if we remove the ID, so we get uh, multiple recipes, it just iterates over the template multiple times. So we see a bunch of recipes here now. Uh, rendered with the cards. And, uh, you know, we can even uh, just use traditional styling. We could have a style element here in the template if we wanted to. And if we do that, uh, we can add, you know, three lines of CSS here to start uh, a two-column grid. We have our cards in a grid. And then uh, just kind of a, a fun little uh, additional trick here. The uh, generic Drupal web components library uses uh, a package uh, called open props which adds a, uh, a really great set of design tokens that are just CSS custom properties. Um, so we can use those here as well to add, uh, you know, some more styling tweaks to these cards. Um, so change the color of the headings, add a drop shadow, uh, rounded corners, all that stuff. So, um, you know, again, <laughs> really long walk to get, get over here, but uh, I think that these two, uh, Having just a, a, a broad way that we can get data from Drupal that can be shared across all of these components in a consistent way really opens up some, some interesting possibilities. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, given all that, uh, you know, a, a question is, you know, where, where could we go from here? And, and I performed an extremely unscientific uh, survey to kind of get a feel for how Drupal stands in the wider JavaScript ecosystem, which was searching stuff on NPM. And, uh, you know, this is a little outdated, the screenshot at this point, but uh, if you search for Drupal on NPM, uh, the results are uh, maybe not exactly what you expect. So, you know, first result here is an implementation of parts of Drupal's user slash access control API. Um, there, if we do scroll down a little bit, there is Drupal SDK. Is that Drupal's official SDK? Uh, there are other Drupal SDKs there. Um, so yeah, my, for somebody who just searches Drupal, which I, I could easily see a JavaScript developer who says, who was told they have to work with Drupal doing this, um, it's a potentially a confusing set of results. M maybe you uh, know that you can look at organizations in NPM. You might want to see what Drupal as an organization has. Uh, this is currently what we have under the official Drupal namespace on NPM. Uh, two packages that are used by core. Uh, the exciting news is that uh, hopefully maybe even uh, this week, uh, there are two more packages that we'll be publishing under the Drupal namespace coming out of the decoupled menus initiative. So doubling <laughs> the number of packages here. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking at this today, uh, you know, it might not even be clear like how Drupal would use those things. Uh, search for WordPress. Um, this is uh, more in line with what I would have anticipated searching for Drupal. First thing is a client for working with WordPress. And then I see a bunch of things under 
uh, the WordPress namespace. I think part of what drives that is the, the block editor in WordPress in that it's React, and this is probably a lot of things that uh, WordPress core and the block editor use, but still, uh, this uh, makes more sense and seems a, a little more JavaScript friendly uh, to me. And then uh, take something like Contentful, which you know it's not the perfect one-to-one -one comparison because it's an exclusively headless CMS, um, but people who uh, might be working with Drupal might be familiar with Contentful or have worked with it in the past. And you know, obviously, there is a really clear client for Contentful here, a bunch of things under the Contentful namespace. Uh, you know, it has to be like this because this is the primary way to interface with Contentful. Um, but again, compared to the results that Drupal gets, uh, it's, a, it's a different story. So uh, how could we improve this? So uh, I, as I've probably uh, tipped my hat to uh, a little bit already, I think it would be good if Drupal had a larger presence under the Drupal namespace on NPM. I, I do believe, whether it's this or something like it in the future, uh, that Drupal should have some sort of official client or SDK. Um, and then uh, also, you know, a little bit of an offshoot and something that kind of came out of the decoupled menus initiative, but um, we don't really have any documentation on Drupal.org about decoupled Drupal and this approach uh, to building sites. Uh, and I think that would be really useful both for the community, but also to you know, make it clear that this is something that you know, is important uh, to Drupal and the community. So uh, some things uh, that possible next steps, some things that are uh, in progress. So I, I would love to see us promote more things into the, the Drupal namespace on NPM. There are two packages uh, from uh, coming out of the decoupled menus initiative, we've been talking with the JavaScript maintainers uh, about getting that, that done. So that will actually start to expand. You know, I have wondered something like that Drupal JSON API params package that is used by a lot of decoupled uh, projects, like something that has found success within the community. Maybe there's a case to move things like that over to the Drupal namespace in the future. Um, I also did create a, uh, an issue in the ideas queue a little while back about a proposal to, you know, formally try to start a process to build uh, SDK or client-like utilities in Drupal. Uh, if that idea is interesting to you, uh, I would encourage you to check in on that issue, leave comments. Uh, there hasn't been a ton of traction around it. I don't know if it's because I haven't been able to really drive it or if that shows that people aren't interested. I don't know. Um, but yeah, check that out. And then uh, within the decoupled menus initiative, we definitely tried uh, to keep the scope down to just uh, decoupled menus, but there was a lot of early thought around like what could Drupal-wide decoupled Drupal documentation be, um, early outlines and things. So this is a meta issue to try to move that forward. I'd, I'd love to see something that happens in the future is for uh, people to contribute to actual uh, full decoupled Drupal uh, documentation. And there is a home in the Drupal developer guide for it, so we've taken some initial steps there. And uh, this is the part where I uh, somewhat irresponsibly uh, uh, share thoughts on uh, the Dries note yesterday <laughs> and some things that kind of came up in this, this neighborhood uh, very recently. But uh, for those who uh, saw the Dries note or, or didn't, um, towards the end, uh, Dries talked about uh, things that we can do after Drupal 10 is released and kind of uh, encouraging to, to try to push forward in the area of, of in innovation again. Um, and some things that came up under that were, were to keep investing in headless and the idea of there possibly being some sort of uh, official Drupal the JavaScript uh, front-end reference implementation, uh, which are both things that, that I unsurprisingly support. Um, and also, yeah, the, the call to action here that w these are things we could start in, in on now and, and a lot of this stuff already exists. So I think a lot of the groundwork for you know, a, a client or common SDK utilities, obviously you know, projects like this, or the other clients that have been out there, there's really a lot that exists today uh, where we could try to bring some of this stuff into Drupal itself somehow in an official capacity. And uh, this uh, is an, an old slide from a, a past uh, Dries note where he introduced the idea of the decoupled menus initiative. Uh, 
you know, hurts a little bit because, uh, you know, it took us a, a, long, a long time to get to that flag up at the top, way more than it should have. Um, but, you know, we certainly learned some interesting things along the way, and, and I feel like if you squint your eyes a little bit, you squint, um, you know, you have a similar mountain for, you know, thinking to the end goal of having a reference implementation where starting to build out these utilities uh, will be useful to the community, but could be kind of underlying support for this. Maybe an official client is created, and then perhaps that reference implementation could actually use these things uh, that were built. But, you know, it's only if you squint. Um, so, uh, definitely uh, related contribution efforts going on uh, this week. I'll, uh, I'll be kicking around the contrib room this afternoon. I'll be there most of the day tomorrow. Uh, would love to talk about this stuff more. There's issues in the Drupal State issue queue if you're interested. Um, there's that ideas issue for the idea of an official Drupal client. Would love to get people's feedback on that. For the couples menus initiative, we are hopefully going to get the actual core menu endpoint merged this week. We're so close, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, and there's also some things that we're going to do uh, tomorrow around documentation. So if anybody would be interested in uh, trying to, to wrap up or provide feedback on the decoupled menus documentation or look at what we could do in the future for decoupled documentation, would love to talk about that. And there's also the generic Drupal Web Components project in general. If you're looking to experiment with web components, that would be a great place to do it. Um, you know, uh, open to any and all contributions, and there is a almost a limited amount of things that we could, <laughs> in fact, build and offer in that. Um, yeah, and I think that I is it. Have a, a little bit of time for questions, um, and also thanks. Were there any any app magic app questions? Uh, people here, if they have questions, can also uh, hop up to the mic over there. Yeah. So uh, the the question was uh, I mentioned parallels between Next for Drupal and Drupal State. Can I uh, you know uh, go into the the differences? So uh, first off, Next for Drupal is a kind of larger scale project, and and Drupal State is just a, a piece of interfacing with uh, JSON API. So Next for Drupal is a it also has a starter kit for Next.js, um, example page templates, other utilities. Um, but Next for Drupal also does have to communicate with JSON API. Um, and uh, somewhat recently, as the 1.3 release a few months ago, they also added their own client. Um, they had uh, helper utilities who that did a lot of the same things, but now they, they have a client as well. And looking at the two clients, uh, they're accomplishing pretty similar things. You know, there's only so much you can do with JSON API, so it makes a lot of sense that they would be doing similar things. Um, so from the perspective of this project, I, I would love to see a, a, a situation where we might be able to start abstracting some of the underlying utilities and underlying things that those two clients do that would actually be under the, the Drupal namespace and that these clients could start instead consuming those. Um, I think that would be a, a great step in the direction of, of trying to not have these competing clients. Um, and from my perspective, you know, I, I like, I just want there to be a good solution here. I don't necessarily care if it's mine or somebody else's. Uh, the other thing to mention about Next for Drupal, uh, it is obviously really focused on both Next and Drupal. Um, you know, the, the Drupal part makes sense. We're not going to get out of that. But there are some, uh, I guess the better way to say it is both Next and React. So there are some Next uh, specific concepts baked in a little bit, some React specific things like hooks. Um, so something like Drupal State is intended to be framework agnostic. So you can use it with React or Vue or whatever JavaScript framework is cool in two years. Um, and I think that is important for uh, whatever we offer in this space. I don't think it would be a lot of work to unwind those, uh, you know, React-specific assumptions from Next for Drupal's client, um, but I don't know if they'd be interested in doing that. Yes, in the back.
category or something, but once when it comes to post-text search, yeah, when you want to search something in your receipt, how do you handle this? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the short answer is that, that right now, this, this library does not have, you know, an answer for that. Uh, we can get back all of the data and store it locally so that you could build search utilities on top of it. Uh, you know, I, I definitely do see a world where we could have supporting utilities try to make search easier. Um, but there really, there, there really isn't anything today. But I, I think th really the, the way well, one of the ways to solve that is really just being able to have the consistent way to, to manage application state and trying to, you know, limit the calls to search where you can. That's a piece of that puzzle. But yeah, we don't really have an answer for that right now. Good question, though. Anything else? Yes. So the, the question slash comment was that in the past you saw an amazing uh, React admin theme um, and, you know, could something like Drupal State make that possible? I mean, it would definitely be a, a, a small piece of the puzzle. You know, this library doesn't have opinions about rendering anything, really. Um, but, yeah, I do think that, you know, again, it's one man's opinion, but... Uh, if there was a world where we had either a reference implementation or started to, uh, you know, incorporate more React in Drupal itself, and it needed to talk to Drupal's APIs, just a, a, a you know a client or a common way to interface with it would be part of that. It would be kind of underlying technology as part of it. But it, it also won't magically make a, a cool admin API, which I know we would all want. Yes. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused. Me too. <laughs> but this has nothing to do with the PHP Drupal State API where you just use variable get variable set in Drupal 7 and yep. then Forge also has states? Is this not getting Yeah. Right? So uh, I did offhand mention, and this was uh, feedback, friendly feedback I got this week as well, that that's probably not a good name for this library. <laughs> and it is confusing for that reason. Um, so yeah, the, something to think about is maybe if there is a better, more accurate name for this. And the reason that it was named that is, you know, thinking about JavaScript application state, and that was the problem I was trying to solve initially. Um, but as it evolved, you know, it, it's not necessarily exclusively about that problem. It's about utilities to interface with JSON API. So it's kind of grown out of the name. But yeah, good feedback. Thank you. Anything else? Cool. A in general, I'm around and uh, would love to chat more. But uh, thanks, everybody. This was very fun. Enjoy DrupalCon. <laughs>